Um, this is a look at polyphenols, and uh, we're going to look back at that video that I um, did with Grundy. And so we'll um, cover the polyphenol side of things that he goes on about. It's his big little thing nowadays. Um, uh, you know, polyphenol this, polyphenol that. Um, the reality is all these sort of studies that have been done on polyphenols, they're a mixed bag. Um, a lot of them are epidemiological based studies. A lot of them are basically um, very poorly conducted studies. And a lot of them basically seem to tout the benefits, but ignore, and, and that could be healthy user bias. Obviously the people that are using polyphenols compared to people that are not using polyphenols have got a slightly um, different diet. One's probably not engaged with the Randall cycle and one is. So is it is it basically, I would say that is playing a bigger role than what the polyphenols are playing, um, you know? So, and the polyphenols do have a lot of anti-nutrient effects and a lot of um, negative effects as well, which sometimes are completely ignored. As I say, Plants are medicine, they're not food, they're medicine. And I don't discount some of their medicinal properties. In the right dosage and all that, they probably have a place, but are they at the panacea that, are, that is made out to be? I doubt it, you know, just looking from ancestral, looking at tribal groups, they use it for specific purposes. They don't use it as a regular thing on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. It's like basically, you know, people, ask me and say, oh, I do this and that and whatever else. And I go, well, do you realise this inhibits mTOR? Do you realise this um, has this effect? And if you're doing it on a daily basis, it's like even the fisetin. I don't recommend it on a daily basis. I recommend it doing for a specific period in high doses, getting the benefit and then getting back to eating properly because it does inhibit it. And if you do it on a prolonged base, you will end up in a very catabolic state breaking down tissue which is not very healthy you know it's no different than if you basically um gave yourself a compound that actually increased matrix metalloproteinase um activation within your liver and there was no regulatory fat soluble vitamins to control and regulate that well then you do a lot of tissue damage so while certain enzymes, certain compounds can have certain benefit at a certain dose dependent in a certain way um, when applied um, within certain bounds. Overuse or you know misuse can actually have quite a lot of negative effects. So sometimes it's actually better just to keep away from that sort of stuff unless you specifically have to because you're dealing with specific conditions because you've done quite a bit of damage and you're trying to get the body to activate certain pathways to achieve a certain amelioration of a certain pathology or whatever. But anyway, let's just get into it and uh, we'll continue on that. So I'll just share my screen. Anyway, poly polyphenols specifically, what are those? Why do they matter? And how do we begin to get into the new friendlier ketogenic diet? So the new friendlier ketogenic diet, what they mean is plant-based ketogenic diet. Because that's I've been talking about this on some of my live streams, how there's been this sort of shift in the low carb community to more plant-based. You know, it's not it's not new. There's a lot of bias towards animal fats. There's a lot of bias towards animal flesh protein. We see it all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, the level of propaganda, the level of basically cognitive dissidence, the level of, um, you know, even ourselves in our early days, just think back ourselves when we started eating more fat, animal fats and more protein and all that. Back in our head, back there, you know, the brainwashing, you know, it's sort of, you know, there, it was always those echoes. Uh, am I doing it right? Uh, could I be killing myself? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting thinner. I'm, this is happening. I'm feeling better. But could I be killing myself? 
you know, the brainwashing is strong um, in, in our modern world. So it is hard for people to make that shift. And so they will look for benefits, like in the other video that, um, that I just covered recently, um, yesterday, you actually saw that, uh, well, it's actually today, but anyway, um, but you'll actually, you'll, you'll actually um, uh, that it posted, you'll actually see that it was basically, um, you know, the, the animal-based foods and complete ignoring of sort of the, the, uh, the small amount of the other compounds, you know, it's hard for these people, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Grundy was talking, um, you know, where he even talks in other videos and he sort of comments about, oh, it's, you know, it's just the dairy fats. And, you know, he talks a lot about the fats and, you know, because of the uncoupling effect on the mitochondria and all these sort of other things and the polyphenols and all that, as if you don't need nutrition. You know, I mean, you're going to end up frail if you don't get enough protein, animal protein, you know, because again, it's the fear. But he doesn't talk about, you know, the bees pastoralists. They eat plenty of goat meat and plenty of um, lamb meat and stuff like that, you know. And they may use some of these herbal things in some of their dishes and stuff like that, you know. Like even I use oregano and or, or oregano, the, however you want, rosemary and stuff like that. You know, those are basically things because for flavour, and they do have some medicinal things, but too much I wouldn't use because I know that they can have some negative effects in high amounts. So, you know, and sometimes I don't use them at all. But the thing is, and some of these populations don't use them at all, you know, depends what they've got available seasonally and whatever else. And they've dried their own stuff. Dad grows his own herbs and spices and he uses only his. And when he runs out, he uses less, you know, so it's, and using it sparingly just for a bit of flavour. You don't basically just douse the whole thing or like modern day people get these extracts of really high amounts. Well, that's not a good idea because that's not how we consume that. Even in traditional societies, trying to get a hormetic effect did not consume them in those large amounts. You know, as I said, this logic, more is better, is just illogical. Anyway, because that's not the ancestral way. You don't see that with tribal people running around um, grinding up shitloads of spices and actually consuming heaps of them. You see them, they put the animal out, they stretch it and all that, and then they cook it. They're not there basically throwing shitloads of herbs and spices on it. You know, it's just modern day people have really lost the plot. Uh, DNP, dinitrophenol. Phenol. Hmm. Where have I heard that word before? Polyphenols. Polyphenols are used by plants to protect their energy producing organelles, which are their mitochondria, but they're called chloroplasts. Yep, yep, that, that's fine. You know, polyphenols to be used to protect their mitochondria. We use glutathione, Steve. We use glutathione. We use melatonin. We use those things and superoxide dismutase. We use those intracellular antioxidants that actually do a wonderful job. And they're actually even more potent than polyphenols. But in order to basically activate those, you basically either, for melatonin, blue blocking glasses, having a steak in the evening, which will basically give you more um, uh, taurine, which will modulate down um, cortisol in the evening and allow melatonin to rise more, wear blue blocking glasses to eliminate um, uh, you know, the, the blue light that can actually affect melatonin production in the evening and you will get good sleep and you'll get the, um, uh, those uh, you know, repairs of the mitochondria. You know, that's how we've done it. That's how our bodies do it. Polyphenols do it for the plants. Wonderful, good for them, you know, that's their mechanism, their intracellular anti antioxidant system, which is polyphenols. But, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, it translates necessarily really well across the humans. You've got to be careful about that, extrapolating from, you know, because I don't think if we put melatonin or we supplemented the trees with melatonin or superoxide dismutase or glutathione, you'd get the same effects. You know, somehow I doubt you would. So 
Let's go back to us for just a second. Oxygen, we have to have oxygen to make ATP normally. Oxygen is very damaging to our mitochondria. All these free oxygen radicals, yes, we know. blah, blah, blah. So we can't live without oxygen, but we can't live with, with it. And so well, that's why we've got those intracellular anti antioxidants that deal with that problem. As long as we don't put shove too much glucose down our throat and fructose down our throat and add too much deuterium shit, that causes a lot of problems to the mitochondria, you know, in terms of the quality of the metabolic water that's produced through the Krebs cycle. As long as we're not doing that, we're not going to have these problems, Steve. You know, and we don't need the polyphenols to deal with that sort of stuff. So we have to, you know, sop up the damage the oxygen does. Plant. Yeah, well, it's called glutathione. It's a wonderful thing. So on the other hand, have to have... Oh, and the other thing is you have to be in a low carbohydrate state. You have the higher the insulin, the lower the glutathione. So what is that telling you? It's actually telling you it, it would be like a plant having lower, lower polyphenols. You know, if you did something, you shouldn't do to it. And what does it do? The plant concentrates in the, in the fruit in that growth factor away from the rest of the plant. It depletes deuterium from the rest of the, the plant, the tree, puts it all in as a growth factor into that seed, you know? Obviously, <laughs> that's where it's concentrating it. Have the little fruit, uh, my dear animal. <laughs> it's nice and yummy and sweet and deuterium laden. Ooh, that'll sort you out. Your body will, will really try and expel it as far as possible at the rear end. Yes, we know what happens with too much fruit. Sunlight, and they kind of reverse engineer. They take photons from sunlight, combine it with CO2, and they make glucose and ATP. Yep. Sunlight is damaging to the plant mitochondria, the chloroplast. So they actually generate polyphenols to... Exactly. Like we generate glutathione. To protect their mitochondria from damage, their chloroplast. Precisely what we do with glutathione. And things like melatonin get your sleep in. Very important. Chloroplast. We get to see every fall the polyphenols in plants because the green chlorophyll goes away and all of those beautiful colors of yellows, oranges, reds, dark colors are the polyphenols that the plant generated to protect and uncouple mm. the mitochondria of plants. And it turns out the way they protect the mitochondria is to uncouple them to make them work less hard. And the less hard the mitochondria work. The same thing happens when you, you're producing ketones and you're, you're in a low carbohydrate state, you actually have a certain level of uncoupling, which basically reduces the oxidative stress. So, I mean, and when you eat enough protein and fat in one meal, you pretty much are not, uh, um, uh, for the rest of the day, you're basically just generating that low level of energy that you require just to keep things moving along. So, I mean, and our system works slightly different as well because we're constantly um, in a certain level of activity. It's only when we go to sleep at night that's when it's different and that's where melatonin comes in and does a lot of the reparative work on the mitochondria so very important good sleep not polyphenols the less damage sunlight does to them now we eat plants and the polyphenols in plants do two things number one we don't absorb polyphenols from plants very well Obviously, we don't absorb them very well because we're not meant to absorb them. 
you know, they sort of get in if you put large quantities, like, you know, maybe it's telling us something. But our bacteria actually love polyphenols. They're actually a prebiotic fiber for... Yep, that's fine. You know, bacteria basically um, uh, do actually utilize polyphenols. They utilize fiber. They utilize a lot of things, you know. They've been around for a very long time to, and they utilize proteins and fats, all sorts of things. They are the, they don't only, um, you know, <laughs> they don't have a preference of polyphenols. They have a preference for a lot of different nutrients that are in their, in the, their gut environment. So, I mean, let's not just jump on, oh, the bacteria doing that. You know, again, the gut microbiome sort of nonsense, but you know, because you guys are well informed, you know, with that other one about the metabolite that actually improves the gut microbiome, where it actually inflammasome upregulates interleukin 16 and that AMP, and that actually normalizes your gut microbiome. And that only comes from having a sufficient taurine in your diet. And that only comes from having sufficient animal foods in your diet that fix your gut and actually bring it to normality to work within the proper homeostatic physiological um, uh, state that it should, you know, not the gut microbiome on its own does not do it. It's all these other signaling pathways and you guys know it. And these buffoons are still wondering. Or bacteria. Mm. And the bacteria then convert those polyphenols into absorbable polyphenols, which then go to our mitochondria and uncouple them. It's, I can, every time I say this, I hear the Lion King, the circle of life playing in. Well, is that a good thing? Is it a good thing? That's what we need to ask ourselves. Some level of uncoupling that we get from a low carbohydrate diet and all that but if you were to actually have shit loads of this remember there was a there was a drug like years ago that basically allowed you to lose a lot of weight what it did was it actually uncoupled your mitochondria as a consequence yes you did lose a lot of weight but you died as well because severe uncoupling will actually cook your body up it will increase your internal thermal and in, um, beyond the physiological level so there is a natural way of achieving uncoupling within the physiological limit that doesn't stress the body and damage cells with too much heat. And then there's the buffoonerized way where we reductionist way, we go, oh, let's use polyphenols and let's just hammer the body and actually uncouple it. Let's lose shitloads of weight. Yes, but there are consequences. Anyway, enough of that that character polyphenols it's well known animal studies have shown that high doses of polyphenol supplementation may cause kidney damage tumors and imbalance in the thyroid hormone levels in humans they may result in an increased risk of strokes and premature deaths got it guys polyphenols are not all they're meant to be a small amount may cause a bit of uncoupling a small amount may have some little benefits hermetic benefits or maybe some other benefits um in in this regard or that regard but you know i mean in addition some polyphenol rich foods such as beans peas may be rich in lectins <laughs> yes that's great isn't it <laughs> lectins may cause unpleasant digestive symptoms such as gas floating in the <laughs> indigestion yeah something that all the vagoonerized community are well aware i hope you're getting your polyphenols as well <laughs> and let alone you know plant sterols you know another thing that basically in plants which basically go into the red blood cells and stiffen them that's not that you don't want plant cholesterol you know it stiffens and then the actual you create hypoxia regions inside your body in the small little vessels where these plant, these red blood cells can't get through anymore because they can't elongate because only with cholesterol inside them can they elongate properly. So this is a problem with people taking all these sort of crazy supplements. You know, 
the literature is quite clear. You know, a lot of the actual studies that are out there about all, um, you know, that these things are about polyphenols and all that. You get the summary. Polyphenol rich foods are considered safe for most people while supplements may cause more harm than good. And that is, I disagree entirely with that first state, part of the statement that uh, the that these foods are, you know, they're not species appropriate as far as I'm concerned. But I do agree with that part that, you know, they do more harm than good. And we've seen a lot of things, you know, I mean, like, uh, you know, even sort of compounds in uh, broccoli and stuff like that, sulforaphane, so you know, garbage. It can actually affect negatively your thyroid. Why would you take that sort of stuff? It's again, polyphenols again, have a negative effect on the th thyroid as well, you know, let alone all these other effects. They're not a good thing in that regard. You know, when we look at uh, risk and safety of polyphenol consumption, we look in the literature, and this is basically this article has given an overview of the potential hazards of polyphenol consumption as reported during the roundtable discussion at the first international conference on polyphenols and health held in Vinci, France, um, November 2003. Adverse effects of polyphenols have been evaluated primarily in experimental studies. It is is known that, for example, that certain polyphenols may have carcinogenic and genotoxic effects. That means carcinogenic, you, that doesn't need to be explained. Um, genotoxic basically means a toxicity to your actual cells integrity, the genome, and may interfere with thyroid hormone biosynthesis. Yes, that's the last thing we need now with an army of people out there with hypothyroidism issues on a, on a vagunarized diet. We don't need to add to that misery by supplementing the rest of the population. Isoflavones are particularly interesting because of their estrogenic activity. Wonderful. Men, that's what you need, estrogen. Yes, for which beneficial as well as detrimental effects have been observed. Well, obviously, it depends on the dose. Furthermore, consumption of polyphenols inhibit um, non-heme iron absorption. Yes, that's another thing that a lot of the vagoons don't realise. Actually, polyphenols inhibit non-heme iron. The primary heme, uh, the primary iron that they actually consume in their in their in their um, uh, vegetables and stuff like that. The polyphenols in there are inhibiting and may lead to iron depletion in populations with marginal iron stores. Well, we know who are the marginal iron stores. They're called the vagunarized community. Finally, polyphenols may interact with certain pharmaceutical agents and enhance their biological effects. Mm, yes, that could be a problem in that regard. It is important to consider the doses and at which these effects occur in relation to concentration and naturally occurring in the human body. Future studies evaluating it, the benefits or adverse effects should therefore include relevant forms of dose, um, dosages, polyphenols, and before developing development of fortified foods or supplements with pharmacological doses, safe assessment of the applied doses should be performed. And this is the problem. There's a lot of supplements out there that have got very high doses of polyphenols. They are a problem. You know, a lot of people say, oh, this has got wonderful, really large amounts. More isn't better. Believe me, more isn't better. The problem is Grundy is actually there, you know, just promoting it like mad. Anyway, intake in the recommendations made by the company selling various um, nutritional supplements rich in polyphenols. Some recommend the consumption of 50 milligrams per day, isoflavonoids, or 100 to 300 milligrams a day of grape seed extract rich in proanthocyanins. These intake levels are close to those derived by the consumption of soy products in Japan or the grapes and wines of some European countries. 
However, some supplement manufacturers recommend intake far higher than those recommend those current associated with the diet. And that's where you start getting into problems. And a lot of the supplements out there are way too high. Tablets or um, capsules containing 300 milligram of quercetin, one gram citric flavonoid, or 20 milligrams of resveratrol with suggestions, suggested uses of one to six tablets or capsules per day are commonly found on the internet. This would result in intake of a hundred times higher than the common intake in a Western diet. Got it? hundred times, oops. Way beyond. Quercetin, I actually use, I've used recently since I've um, had, you know, with my zinc supplement and it has been to stop, reduce replication. So I'm using it for a short, I use it for a short period of time. I've had it in my drawer for, for ages now. I haven't used it and I've just used it for, three days that was it for three days with zinc to stop to slow down replication as an antiviral and you know i've pretty much recovered pretty well um with a reason c19 yes still isolating currently yes well you know have to according to the law otherwise you will be charged Eight thousand six hundred and something dollars. I think it's six hundred and fifty. So quite a lot of dosh. So I'm still here until Friday. So today's Wednesday. So obviously I've got one and a half days to go, and then I'm out of quarantine or isolation. Yes, and they I, they can't level a charge against me. Anyway, so they've got a risk table to go through. You know. And there was one other part here. Most, most of those are polyphenols aim to, aim to determine the protective effects of polyphenols against disease or toxic drugs and relatively few investigations have examined the possible toxicity. And that's the problem. Most studies are short term. And they're looking at, you know, you know, certain compounds can bind up certain toxins and eliminate it out of the system. And they have been used, certain of these, um, for that purpose. But while they can force the quicker metabolism of, uh, of a drug, and get it out of the system because they seem to be able to upregulate certain detoxification pathways in the liver. That's a good thing as a short-term intervention, but a long-term intervention may have other toxic effects systemically throughout the whole body. That's the problem. And we don't look at those. And there's very few studies out there that are done because the majority of the supplement companies, well, they don't want to do those studies because not a good thing, not a good image for their product. They're selling product where there's a couple of independent people that have done some of this study. And this is what they've actually looked at, um, these people that are reviewing the literature and looking at um, this information in that regard. So at the bottom is all the references. People can go through and actually check them themselves. I'm just giving a bit of an overview um, on what the literature is saying and what the conference covered, um, which is based on the literature. So that's one nice thing about these sort of conferences. They get together and they actually talk about all the gossip, you know, about the manufacturers, about the products and stuff like that. So if you ever, if you're in academia and you get a chance, go to one of these conferences. You'll probably get a lot of insight in some of the, you know, information that neither can I actually get because they never actually put it out there, but, you know, it will be discussed behind closed doors. So do keep that in mind if you can get an opportunity. Some polyphenols ha um, may have carcinogenic or genotoxic effects, high doses, uh, caffeine acid, for example, when present at 2% levels in the diet, induced stomach and kidney tumors in rats and mice, wonderful. Uh, 
linear extrapolation of these that are indicated appreciable risks at normal dietary levels. Shit, even normal dietary levels, are, if you're constantly consuming them, they can be a problem. You know, so of course it inhibits O methylation in catecholoestrogen and increases kidney concentrations of two to four hydroxyl estradiol by 60 to 80 percent not a good thing so there you go another reason why you don't want to be taking quercetin every every single bloody day but in in order to for basically to enhance the effect of because uh, it's you know it's an ionophore to enhance the effect of the actual um uh, you know the antiviral effect with the zinc using it for a couple of days is fine you know if you're basically doing it for constantly that's when it becomes a problem you know so anyway um Also, flavonoids are a family of polyphenols that are distinctive because of their estrogen-like activity. Wonderful. You know, and there's quite a lot of those. And they do cause problems in a number of populations. This is a particular importance for um, baby boys who normally exhibit luteinizing hormone secretion between birth and six months of age. So you definitely don't want to have all these soy flavonoids and all that in soy-based infant formula. Not a good thing. You know, kids should be sucking on the tit and actually getting proper nutrition from the mother. Some sort of um, polyphenols may also have anti-nutritional effects, the inhibition of non-heme ion absorption, attribution to um, stimulating tea consumption, is well known. Well, we, we know that a number of teas do have that effect. High consumption of polyphenols may increase the risk of iron depletion in populations or those blah, 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 blah. We covered that before. Importance in that respect. Major source of polyphenols such as tea, coffee, tea, and wine, which are regularly consumed with meals, do not contain vitamin C, which is an enhancer of non heme ion absorption. We don't have that problem. We consume meat. We get plenty of um, he mine and we don't have to worry at all and i usually do not have coffee with my meal it usually is in between meals um, that's one thing that i've always done so now is is it a species appropriate food no it's not but i like it <laughs> like a lot of you like it as well Uh, further pro uh, anthocyanins condensed tannins ah uh, yes uh, lovely stuff g tannins have been considered anti-nutrient nutritional compounds particularly in animal nutrition because they are able to interact with protein and inhibit um, several enzymes the protease inhibitors as well many of these things but they do affect the actual function of several of enzymes as well so it's they are problematic they affect the, gro the growth and digestibility in rats when added to the diet at high doses but not at low doses consumption of um proethanocyanin rich Fava um, beans by an Egyptian boy reduced the net protein utilization, which was restored with the dehulling of the beans. So once they got rid of that outer part by probably soaking them, like they used to do traditionally, and got rid of that part where this component is very, the child was able to basically utilize the protein better in the diet and grow. So yeah, there's, but remember, there are bean 
eating the goons out there that are basically feeding their kids a lot of these sort of anti-nutrients and they don't even have the tradition of knowing how to soak them and eliminate the anti-nutrients it's a disaster out there in the modern of the goonerized communities because they've got no idea they've got no culture they've got no tradition of eating these sort of plant foods and don't even know how to deactivate there's a lot of work involved that's why. why would you do it for the very little nutrition this is poor people's they were forced to eat like this in southern india and other parts of the world you know we don't have to it's ridiculous should be noted that these particular effects are unlikely to occur with regular Western diets. Yeah, even the sad diet doesn't have a lot of these anti-nutrients we know because they're all refined. It's a, it's a different problem with the sad diet. It's basically engaging the Randall cycle because of refined oils and, and, uh, and sugar at very high amounts, which are characterized by much lower tannin intake. Yes, we know that. It's actually people that are trying to become healthy that end up with a lot of these problems. You know, it's, yeah, I, uh, even myself, you know, the old keto days and shitloads of oxalate um, from spinach and all that, uh, wonderful stuff. So anyway, I'm not going to cover any more of this sort of stuff, but, uh, you know, what they actually, they've pretty much, you know, you know, they've, Pretty much covered a lot of this sort of stuff um, that and there's a number of the citations of studies in that regard but the key thing the the, the key take-home message guys is do you need these polyphenols in your diet no you don't you know we're not a plant I don't need a plant compound that has a whole lot of side effects, anti-nutrient side effects, and a whole lot of other side effects and potentially even, you know, very risky um, to cause um, other health issues when I can basically just put myself in a low carbohydrate state and I can upregulate glutathione, superoxide dismutase and melatonin and pretty much actually get these intracellular antioxidants, the capacity for the glutathione to be high enough to basically recycle vitamin C and vitamin E and maintain the, these levels at an optimal level to do the job that are supposed to do in, in, in animals. You don't see basically a lion going to the supplement store Where's my polyphenols? I need to, I need to, um, you know, uncouple my mitochondria and protect my mitochondria. No, it doesn't. It just eats a species appropriate diet, and those systems work. Like the plant, the plant basically sucks nutrients up from the ground, and it's basically generates those polyphenols to protect its mitochondria. Great, that's what it's designed for. It's that's it's supposed to be in that species to do that job, not in us, you know, we're an animal based, you know, we've got, we're made of fat, cholesterol and protein. We're not made of fiber. So, I mean, we don't need these things. We've got other mechanisms to deal with, you know, solar radiation. How do we repair with solar radiation? It's called retinol, which is a fat soluble vitamin. It's called niacin, which is a B vitamin that's primarily in things like pork and tuna and chicken as well. Then and in other animal foods as well, but slightly less. You know, there's your, there's your, your, your there's the two two components that do most of dealing with damage and all that. And if you take a look at the creams that they put out there. What have they got? They got niacin. They got um, basically, you know, B vitamins. They've got retinol. That's what they've got because they are the thing suited. What do you, people pay thousands of dollars when they just need to eat the food that's got those substances, and they're going to get the same effects. You know, 
it'll be working from the inside out rather than this sort of stuff on the outside and hoping for the best and quite expensive as well. So yeah, anyway, guys, I just wanted to cover um, this whole nonsense about polyphenols. You know, when I start growing, um, uh, you know, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of branches and, uh, and all that, then I'll consider polyphenols. But until then, I'll stick to intracellular um, antioxidants that my body can produce when I'm on a species appropriate diet. Anyway, don't waste your money on the, on, the, on the stuff. It's likely to cause you more problems in the long run through anti-nutrient effects and stuff like that. So yeah, don't waste, don't, and ignore the hype. It's garbage. Anyway, see you guys.